Hi everyone, my name is Malia Mack and I'm with Aggressor Adventures and we're here to kick off Shark Week with a great conversation about shark experiences, facts, and what to expect when you travel with Aggressor. Before I get into all that, I want to introduce Samantha Whitcraft, a conservation biologist who also works on the Aggressor team. She is a director of conservation and outreach for Aggressor Adventures and executive director at the Sea of Change Foundation, Aggressor's official conservation partner. A Harvard grad, she earned her master's degree in marine affairs and policy at the University of Miami. She is an award-winning Platinum Pro 5000 diver, recognized by the scuba diving industry as an elite water explorer. She's dived with many species of sharks all over the world and has worked for years, both nationally and internationally, to help protect sharks from the unsustainable shark fin trade. Sam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Are you excited? I, I am always excited uh, to talk about sharks. It's probably my single favorite thing in the world to talk about. And I love that it gives us an opportunity, especially during Shark Week, to move people from fear to respect. Because I think given a social media platform like that, that's the most important thing we can do is go from fear to respect. Love that. Great. Well, with that, let's jump right in. So let's start talking about the great white shark. And I wanna talk about that one because not only is it one of the larger species of sharks, but it's one that you frequently see on aggressor dive trips to Guadalupe. Um, so tonight on Discovery Channel, they'll be kicking off Shark Week with a show called Air Jaws Going for Gold, where they're actually going to be taking viewers to Seal Rock to observe great whites hunting. So can you tell us a little bit about their methods and you know how a great white shark goes about hunting in an area like that? Yeah, um, I'm super excited for that one. Air Jaws is always one of my favorites because uh, I mean, there's nothing like seeing a great white shark just blast out of the water into the air. I mean, uh, I have not had the privilege of seeing that live and in person, although it's very high on my bucket list. Um, <laughs> But what I understand about that phenomenon there from the published science and from talking to colleagues um, is that what is happening is that those sharks are um, maximizing their ambush hunting given where they are and what the prey is. So a little bit of background, white sharks, like many species, but specifically in this case, white sharks, how they hunt um, can depend on what sex it is, what size they are, what age they are, what habitat they're in and where they are geographically. So in this specific location, Seal Rock, sometimes I think also called Seal Island, um, the depth there can get quite deep close to shore where the seals are. And so, and I'm gonna refer to my notes because I specifically looked this up in the literature because the numbers are astounding. So back in 2004, 2005, some scientists there decided that they were going to try and figure out this exact question. Like, what are these sharks doing here? How are they hunting? What is this incredible breaching behavior that we're seeing? So they used video, which I assume is some of what you're going to see on Shark Week. They used accelerometers, which is like a speed gauge on your car, kind of. And they used um, uh, depth sensors to start to answer this question. So here's what they found out. These sharks are starting their ascent to ambush these seals at around 66 feet deep. Then they're closing the difference between that depth and the surface in between seven and 16 seconds. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and while they're doing that, their tail beat frequency and the speed at which they're moving increases sixfold in that distance, in that six to 17 seconds. So basically the reason they breach out of the water is because they, they have built up so much momentum by the time they hit that seal or hit the surface near the seal, if they happen to miss, that they just explode out of the water. Um, so it's, it's the bathymetry, which is a fancy way of saying the underwater topography there, combined with how strong sharks can do this maneuver and the fact that the poor little seals are on the surface that combine to make in this specific location, breaching being just a phenomenal thing to see. 
Wow. And it tells you something about the power of these animals. I mean, they're just, just shockingly amazing. Yes, that sounds, I mean, I mean, wow. They come from that deep and just shoot straight up those poor seals, but yeah. hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> Sharks got to eat. Sharks got to eat. There we go. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, you know, on our liverboard experiences, um, guests get the chance to dive with sharks from all over the world. So another show tonight, also airing on Discovery Channel, will be called Shark Trek, featuring William Shatner from Star Trek. Get it? Star Trek, Shark Trek. And he will get to dive during Shark Week. So sure, he's going to create a lot of fun memories and experiences. So wanted to know what has been your favorite shark encounter? And if you could share that with us. So first, let me say as a dyed in the wool uh, sci-fi geek who was raised on the original Star Trek, the, th the only thing that I would love more than diving with sharks would be diving with sharks with Captain Kirk. Like I can't <laughs> even with that. Like I, was, I, I get a little breathless just thinking about it. So I will definitely be watching that one for sure. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I've, I've dived, I counted it up and I, I've dived with, I think, 14 species of sharks. Wow. Um, everything from the biggest bull sharks in Fiji to uh, tiger sharks at Tiger Beach to, you know, big aggregations of lemon sharks to, you know, uh, when I was in Isla Contoy, Mexico, 200 whale sharks at a time. So given all of that, I can still say that my favorite encounter was actually with a baby uh, black tip reef shark. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what <laughs> happened was that I, uh, through when I used to manage programs for an organization called Shark Savers, I got a grant to go uh, with uh, some scientists from Woods Hole to the Line Islands, which is a remote part of the Pacific. And one of those islands is called Palmyra. Um, and in the scientific literature, it's been referred to as the sharkiest place in the world based on the surveys done there. So I was really excited to get there and, you know, it took forever to get the permit to do the dive and we couldn't fly in. We actually had to sail there from Honolulu. It was a big deal. So I went and did the dive and um, it wasn't that sharky. <laughs> and, I, and I realized it was because the sharkiness is more about surveys over time. It's not about getting in the water and the sharks all come to you. So I was feeling, you know, very grateful to be there and to be there with you know, amazing scientists, but I was a little disappointed. So the next day I decided that what I would do is I would hike around the entire island. We were only there for three days that I would hike around the entire island just to really soak it all in and get to know it. So I walked to the far end of the island out where the World War II wrecks are and um, waded out into crystal clear water and about ankle deep water. And, it, and I was just kind of looking at the beauty and the horizon and the seabirds and I heard splashing and I looked down and all around my ankles were like two or three dozen perfect little tiny black tip reef sharks. I mean, each one was less than a foot. I mean, tiny. And they were so, I had never seen them that small and they were so perfect and so beautiful and so zippy and and I realized that, you know, they were interested in whatever I was kicking up out of the sand and they were interested in the splashing in the water and everything. And uh, so I spent a little bit of time with them and then I was like, okay, I've, you know, if I'm going to make it around the island before sunset, I've got to get going. So I started to start on my hike and decided to stay in the, with my ankles, my feet in the water. And I'm walking along, taking it all in and I hear splashing again and I look down and one of the smallest little sharks had decided to stay with me. And he swam like figure eights around my feet and next to my ankle for half an hour, 40 minutes. Wow. And I and I was like, OK, he's adorable and I'm loving this. And I took foot, you know, took GoPro footage and everything. And I thought, but, you know, it's really it's still just about, you know, stuff that I'm kicking up. So I said at this point, I had named him, of course, buddy, little buddy. <laughs> and so I was like. I was like, buddy, I gotta, you have to understand, I was completely alone on this remote, <laughs> on the remote side of a remote island with this baby shark. So I was like, okay, buddy, this has been fun, but I gotta go inland and take some seabird photos. So I went in, took my photos, came back. He was waiting in, in the place where I had left 
And as I started walking, he followed me. And he stayed, it was what I took about six hours to go around the island. And he stayed with me the entire time, so much so that I wanted to make sure that I got back to the same spot where I had picked him up so he could get back to his, his little home. So, and that whole time I got to observe what he was doing. And, you know, and so I love all my encounters with big, giant, toothy, awesome, powerful sharks, but taking a walk with a baby black tip reef shark and the sharkiest island in the world that's always gonna be i think my number one. Oh, that's amazing so cute that's so cute that you named him buddy have you been back to see him do you think he still remembers you i i doubt that very much and and i i would love to go back to palmyra someday it's probably not in the cards it's a very hard place to get to um but the, the follow up to that is that when we went to the next island, which is called Christmas Island, I got very excited to go back into similar habitat and look for some more of my little buddies. And um, when I started interviewing the fishermen and the divers there, they said that a, uh, a large fishing boat had been there. And I mean large, like a factory shipping boat, a uh, fishing boat had been there. And they had gone into the nursery habitat and they had wiped out the entire nursery. Uh, and then uh, I guess about two years later, I was on assignment in uh, Guangzhou, China, investigating the shark fin trade. And in one of the warehouses, one of the bags we found, a massive bag, I mean, as big as me, and a, you know, metric tons of fins, were all little teeny tiny black fin shark fins. Mm. So that's another reason why it's so important to me is because, you know, even the youngest little sharks in these remote places, they're, they're not safe from this no, no, notorious, awful, unsustainable trade. Right. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, well, getting back to Discovery and their lineup of content tonight, um, are you a fan of the show Stranger Things? I am. And in fact, I was so glad you asked that because... It ties into the issue of monsters, right? So a lot of people who have fear of sharks fear them because they think of them as monsters. So I wanted to read this really great quote by uh, famed biologist E.O. Wilson, who's considered by his peers to be the Darwin of the 21st century. Okay. So he wrote in one of my favorite books by him called Biophilia. He wrote, and I quote, we are not afraid of predators. We're transfixed by them, prone to weave stories and fables and chatter endlessly about them because fascination creates preparedness. In a deeply tribal way, we love our monsters. And I think that's so perfect because you can think of something as a monster and still respect it and, and love it. And it's not to say that sharks are monsters, and in fact, one more really important quote on this, Peter Benchley, who wrote the book Jaws that started it all, right? right? Right. One of his most famous quotes, he said, quote, no, the shark in an updated Jaws could not be the villain. It would today instead have to be written as the victim for worldwide sharks are much more the oppressed than the oppressors. So, I just wanted those are two quotes that I think perfectly encapsulate this sort of tension between us thinking of sharks as monsters, but also really respecting and loving them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, with the show tonight on Discovery, they are going to highlight some of those sharks that are a little less common, um, a little more scary just because of how they look and they have those unique or strange features. So, you know, what are so, some of those stranger sharks, you know, that exist that we don't hear about often? Yeah, the ones that pop to mind right away for me are things like the goblin shark and the mega mouse shark. The mega mouse shark was only discovered by scientists in 1976. So it just lets you know that there's all kinds of weird stuff out there in the ocean, you know, that we have yet to discover. Um, and then there's really adorable smaller sharks, too, that I love, like the epaulette shark, which is sometimes called the walking shark because of the way they move. And then the beautiful little coral cat shark, which is a shark you can see on one of our 
uh, liveaboard trips with aggressor. And then recently, and I mean really recently, um, scientists discovered three species of sharks that actually glow in the dark. They oh, bio. Wow. So that's pretty unusual. And, and I guess I wanted to say about sharks not being heard of as much or that we don't talk about them as much. I think it depends on the circles you're in. So for shark geeks like me and shark scientists and, you know, people who are kind of a little bit crazy about sharks, we know, we know about these lesser known sharks. But I think the reason the general public maybe doesn't is because unless they pop into the mainstream, people aren't really going to hear about them. So like unless a goblin shark shows up on like the Florida Keys reef track, which isn't going to happen, you're not really going to hear about it. Whereas occasionally a white shark will show up there and then and you'll hear about it. So I think and also these lesser known sharks tend to be in deeper water or murkier water or more remote places. So the general public just isn't in a, in a space to interact with them. And that's why, you know, these shows that they've been doing for a few years now on Discovery, where they do look at and talk about these more unique, lesser known, lesser appreciated sharks, I, I think are some of my favorite shows because, you know, it's, it's great for people to get to know all these other sharks. Absolutely. I've, I'm looking forward to that one tonight, too. I think to your point, it just gives another reason to just get intrigued by these animals and learn, you know, a completely different perspective that we didn't know, especially those of us in the general public that have one perception of sharks. So that's great. I'm excited for that one. Um, so let's talk about before we close, let's talk about aggressor um, and, you know, those encounters on the trips. So since you are the shark expert, uh, what are some of the things you tell divers on aggressor dive trips when they do encounter a shark? What are some of the things they should be doing, yeah. not doing? Yeah, well, I think I can boil that down to four things that any shark diver, wannabe shark diver should know. The first one is relax, <laughs> relax. It's, it's fine to be filled with adrenaline and awe and a little nervous but there's no need for fear and that's because we are not on the menu and the way i like to explain that to people is imagine you're sitting in your living room and you're watching tv or reading a book or hanging out with your kids and an alien comes down through the ceiling making all kinds of weird not being threatening but making all kinds of weird noises and having some weird stuff hanging off of them and just sits there looking at you mm -hmm. is your first thought mm, dinner no, <laughs> your first thought is what? Yeah, what is going on? What's happening? <laughs> do I want to leave? Do I want to check it out? You know, right. what's what's interesting about this? So that's the first thing is relax. The second thing is to really enjoy it because given how uh, endangered and imperiled so many shark species are, like for example, hammerhead shark populations in much of the world uh, have decreased by as much as 90% in the last 20 to 30 years. So like the picture behind me, if you're with Aggressor Adventures in Galapagos and you get to see schooling hammerheads, you're having a, a peak, epic, once in a lifetime, incredible experience, you know? Um, so relax and really appreciate it. And then number three, Three, I've gotten so excited about hammerheads, I've forgotten what number three is. Let me check my notes. Hold on a second. Uh, where's three? Uh, oh, yeah. Three is, uh, no, four. Yeah. So the fourth is follow the rules and the guidelines of the local experts and dive masters. Because shark diving isn't dangerous when it's done well and sustainably by the experts and the way that it's done well and sustainably is that you follow their guidelines and rules so pay attention during the dive briefing if you have questions about the animals or how you think you might interact or behave ask those on the during the dive briefing um, and behave responsibly in the water so every dive master will tell you no touching, no petting, no chasing. Um, and that's just out of, you know, if nothing else, respect for the wild animal. But every dive location has a few other kind of guidelines. So 
be sure that you that you know those. It'll make the dive better for you and better for the sharks. That's great. Thank you for encounter. But just want to close it with um, telling us about your first diving experience with sharks. What was that like? Yeah, um, that's actually uh, it's raining so hard here. My computer might be getting wet, so I'm just gonna readjust here. So no worries. Get... <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm on a porch, so. Uh, I figured, I, I could hear the rain. I was like, man, it is coming down down there. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> um, so my first dive experience was, um, or diving with sharks, was at Tiger Beach. And um, and I got to meet Emma, one of the most famous tiger sharks in the entire world. Uh, but the background to that is that the first time I ever saw a tiger shark was when I was alone again on a really remote island in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands working for the state of Hawaii as a field biologist and long story short it was the end of the season the tiger sharks had come into the lagoon to feed on the fledging albatross and I wasn't paying as close attention as I should have and a very large tiger as big as my kayak decided to investigate my kayak while I was in it oh no um so that put the that that freaked me out, to be honest. Um, and at, at that point, it was very early in my career. I really, I was working much more with seabirds and turtles and dolphins. I really wasn't the sharky gal that I am now. So by the time I got to Tiger Beach, seven or eight years later, um, I still had this ingrained fear, you know. But I wasn't going to miss the opportunity, right? So luckily, the dive master was a friend of mine, and Tiger Beach. If you know, if you want to do your first big shark dive someplace that's amazing, where the water is crystal clear, where it's well controlled, Tiger Beach is the place to do it. And um, I was down there hanging out with the lemon sharks and then Emma came in and she's so beautiful and so graceful. And she was doing these big ellipses and coming up to each individual diver. And she did her pass by me and she looked me right in the eye. I mean, we made eye contact for, I mean, it had to be a full five seconds, just eye to eye. And, um, you know, when you make eye contact with an animal and you have that moment and you know there's someone there and they know yep. there's someone there and you both know that you know that each other are there. Yep. I had that with her. Hmm. And, and, her and, and tiger shark eyes are beautiful. They're not like that line in Jaws where it says, dead like a doll's eyes. No, they're beautiful. And so we made eye contact and it was in that moment that I went from fear to respect. And that's why I'm such an advocate of respectfully and uh, carefully but joyfully putting people in the water with sharks. Because as soon as you've had that moment, you go from fear to respect. It's just, it, you know, the sharks do all the work for you. It's, it's one of the best conservation tools there is, is putting people in the water with sharks. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully yeah. our conversation today will inspire more people to just do a little bit more research and put themselves out there and, and definitely want to travel with aggressor. Well, Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us during Shark Week and for all your contributions to the conservation of marine life, for sure. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And um, happy Shark Week to you and to everybody. Happy Shark Week. <laughs>